Good morning and welcome to Grace Church. We're so glad that you're able to worship with us today. Uh, So let's sing together. worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. And see what a Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Oh, He has done great things. of heaven you conquered the grief you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things been faithful through every storm you'll be faithful forevermore and you have done great things and i know you will do it again for your promise is yes and amen you will do great things oh god you do great things conquered the grief you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things Above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. And hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God. You have done great things. You have done great things. Who oh got you to great things? This morning, I'd like to share a passage with you out of the book of Matthew and. What happens here is Jesus and the disciples are um, feeding 5,000 people. And right after that happens, he sends the disciples on a boat and Jesus actually goes to the mountain. Um, Now, when it becomes nighttime, uh, Jesus actually walks out on water and the disciples see him. And uh, while this has been happening, there's actually been a storm going on and they've been kind of freaking out. Uh, And Jesus approaches the boat and the disciples panic. They think it's a ghost. They've never seen somebody walking on water. Uh, And I'm going to pick up here in verse 27. Uh, This is what Jesus says. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. 
He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is an excellent example of God's sovereignty, his power, and how we're appropriately supposed to respond to that. As he was keeping eye contact with Jesus, he was able to walk on water. But as soon as he started to look at his surroundings and see the waves and the wind and this the craziness of the situation that he was in, um, suddenly he became uh, no longer able to walk on the water. He started to sink. And then Jesus reached out his hand and picked him up. Um, in response to all this, it says that the disciples worshipped him. Uh, we're in a very similar situation today uh, where there's a lot of craziness going on around us. There's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of concern. Um, but just as true as the words were for the disciples, they're true for us today that we shouldn't be afraid. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus and stay focused on the fact that he's in control of everything. And with our relationship that we have with him, we will be with him forever. Uh, So I hope that that's comforting to you. And we're going to respond the same way the disciples responded with worship. So let's continue to sing together. You call me out upon the waters, the greed on Faith will stand And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you waters your sovereign hand will be my guide will feed me fail and fear surrounds me you've never failed and you won't start now and I will call upon your above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace and I am of my Savior. The Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. And 
And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are mine Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much that you are in control. Lord, even when we're looking at the waves and the wind, Lord, we know that you're in front of us. And Lord, I thank you so much that we can have a relationship with you. Lord, I thank you so much that we can be called your sons and daughters. And Lord, I thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that in this time right now that you'll comfort us, that you will guide us. And Lord, I pray that uh, we don't become distracted with the uh, uncertainty, Lord, but that we seize this opportunity to glorify your name. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our service here online uh, this morning or whenever you're watching it. You know, people sometimes ask us if it's okay to bring coffee into the auditorium, and we always tell them, yes, they can do that, but they, they just need to put a lid on it. Well, I've got some good news for you this morning. You do not have to put a lid on your coffee. You can relax on the couch this morning, maybe in your pajamas, uh, snuggle up next to whoever's with you, and uh, even eat a Pop-Tart if you want to as, uh, as I speak this morning. Well, today we're going to take a break uh, from our regular series and uh, think a, a little bit more about the specific situation that we are in uh, in the world today. These are obviously times that are very unprecedented and concerning for us. And I think all of us are, are still trying to wrap our minds around what's happening and, and, and how to move forward. And, and everyone is anxious as they try to do that. We are anxious about physical concerns. We want to be careful that we uh, don't get this virus and we're anxious about our physical needs and the safety of other people that we care about and love. And we hear stories that are concerning that are coming from all around the world. We have financial anxieties uh, about the economy as a whole and for many of us, our own jobs and, and health care and things like that. And then, of course, there's the emotional concerns that come along with that. Uh, as we separate from one another, people feel isolated and, and lonely and even bored. And, and I'm especially thinking of the, the kids out there who, who are not uh, currently in school, at least my own kids have expressed a little bit of uh, boredom so far. But so many things have changed in such a short time, and as we look into the future, we have no idea what, what changes might lie ahead of us. But I want to remind us this morning of one thing that has not changed, and one thing that absolutely, positively can never change. And the passage that I'd like to look at this morning is one that if you're familiar in, uh, with any passage in the Bible, it's most likely to be the one. I, I want to focus this morning on John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. And I'm actually going to read uh, beginning in, in uh, 16, and, and we'll look um, through uh, 18. If you are using one of our Bibles here this morning, it's on page 1207. But I will say you better not be using one of our Bibles from here because that would mean that you stole it. And when all of this is over, you're going to need to give that back, please. But let's look at John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. John writes, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, 
but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. My challenge to all of us this morning is to make your life, even today, about magnifying this truth. Why don't we pray as we begin? Father, as we look into this text this morning, we pray that you would help us to um, bring everything that we are feeling inside, all of our concerns and anxieties, the, the restlessness that exists within all of our hearts to you. We pray that you would help us this morning to focus on these precious truths here that you, you say we can root ourselves in, not only daily, but for all eternity. So help us to reflect on this passage and to be able to apply uh, the lessons that we take from it into our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, John 3.16 starts out with these very familiar words, for God so loved the world. I think in times like this, we have um, a real tendency in a very positive way to think about God's sovereignty in this world. God's uh, sovereignty means that he is in charge of everything and that there is absolutely nothing that can happen that is outside of his control. Uh, God's sovereignty means that he has an awareness of everything that is happening. There's, there's nothing that he cannot see. Uh, you get a sense of this in Psalm chapter 139, verses 11 through 12. And the, the writer says this, If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. And what the author is suggesting is that even though there may be some things in life that are dark to the person who's writing it, God sees everything, even the darkness is as light to him. Uh, right now we're recording this sermon on Thursday morning, and you are likely watching it on Sunday morning, which means that the next few days, Friday and Saturday, I have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, I'm not sure what the news will be. But you are in a different position. You know exactly what happened on Friday and Saturday. And so those things which are dark to me right now from my perspective are light to you. And the author here says that everything is like that for God. There is no dark for God. There's nothing that isn't penetrated by his sight and understanding. And what that means is that God is, is not only just as aware of the present, of the future as he is of the, the present, but because God is everywhere and sits outside of time, he is actually in some way that's mind-boggling to us, present even in the future just as he is here today. God is aware of all things. That's what his sovereignty teaches us. But not only that, God, the Bible says, is in control of all things. Paul wrote in, in Romans 8, chapter, uh, verse 28, he says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So God not only is aware of all things, but he is working all things for good. And what that means is that God has a plan. And God's plan is being worked out throughout history. And what Paul would say in the book of Romans is that that plan, in the end, will be shown to be a plan that is good. Charles Spurgeon once described God's sovereignty as a pillow that we rest our heads on. When we curl up in our beds at night, 
we can sleep, we can rest knowing that God has a plan, that God's working that plan out, and that it is a good plan. That's God's sovereignty. And what I want to suggest this morning is that if God's sovereignty is like a pillow, then God's love is like a warm blanket. Because God's love goes hand in hand with his sovereignty. God's love shows the, the posture that he has, the attitude that he has as he works out his sovereign and good plan. And, and what this teaches us is that that plan isn't just a good plan, but that it is also a loving plan. John 3.16, again, for God so loved the world. Now that word, uh, world, that we find in John 3.16, the, 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 word, the Greek word is the word cosmos. And uh, cosmos has kind of two shades or slants to its meaning. The first is that it describes the ordered universe. So it says God so loved the ordered universe, if, if you can imagine at the very center of our earth, there's some atom that right now, at least for this split second, exists right at the core of the earth. And if you build your way out eventually to the mantle and the crust of the earth and all of the oceans and, and shorelines and people and places and things, and then you keep expanding out to the moon all the way out to the ends of the universe, that is the ordered universe. And this verse says that God loves all of it. That word has kind of another slant, and, and, and that is that the word cosmos sort of pushes us to recognize that it's also an ordered universe that is in rebellion against God. And what that means is that God doesn't just love all the good things that exist within the world. God loves the bad parts too. God loves those people who are wicked and he loves those people who are righteous. Later on in this passage, he's going to call whoever would believe uh, to, to himself. And that word whoever shows us that God loves everyone. And he makes an offer to uh, anyone. God's love is for the entire world. You know, God's love is also the source of love for the entire world. 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, just like you, I have many people in my life who I love in different ways. Uh, I love my wife in a special way. And I remember our, our wedding day, the joy that I had for her and that she had for me and our enthusiasm and those are things that we still share for one another that are just between the two of us. We have a love that is reserved for one another. I love my children in a different way. Uh, when each of them were born, I, I felt like my heart blew up a little bit like a balloon and I was able to love in ways that I didn't think possible. I, I felt I understood more about love when they came into the world. I have a certain kind of love for my extended family, um, great desire to be with them and a concern that uh, they would be safe and protected. I have a love that I experience for my friends. Um, I have a close friend of mine uh, right now who works uh, in, in a hospital and I am so proud of him. I, I think of him uh, constantly and I'm just swelled up with concern and, and pride for him. We experience not just love generally, but all sorts of different categories of love for different kinds of people. And what 1 John tells us is that these are the kinds of feelings that God's heart is filled with too. And we know that because John tells us that 
God is the very source of love. And what that means is that God isn't just loving. It, it isn't as if love exists up here and, and God happens to experience that love. It's the other way around. It, it tells us that God actually is love. He is the very definition of love. And any love that we experience on earth is love that he has supplied for his heart is the wellspring of all of our love. And what that means is something incredible. That is, that the only way that God can operate is in love. If God defines love, then it is not possible for God to do anything that is unloving. And his love, we're told in the book of John, is for all the world. So I think that leads us to ask the question, if God is loving, and if God is sovereign, then why does he allow us to be in the circumstances that we are in today? And, and the answer to that question is that we just don't know. We, we don't know why God has allowed the circumstances that are around us to happen. And many people could suggest many good possibilities to that. But the truth is we cannot understand the the mind of God. But what we do know is that God has a plan that he is working out that is for good and that even now he is operating out of a loving heart. You know, that can be so difficult for us to, to fathom. Uh, this week we were having dinner uh, together, uh, our family was, and we have two rules for the kids at dinner. If they want dessert, first of all, they have to eat their dinner. And second of all, they have to be on good behavior. And my three-year-old was pressing it at dinner and, and uh, pressing the, the behavior part of that. And so I warned her a couple of times that if, if she kept it up, that she would not be able to have a popsicle. And eventually she did it again. And I had to say to her, I'm sorry, but no popsicle for you. And her response was shock. I, I, she just couldn't believe that I would tell her that she couldn't have a popsicle. And she said, does everybody else get a popsicle? And I said, yeah, they've eaten their dinner and they've been on good behavior. So it's, it's just going to be you. And her eyes got real big and she started to cry. And it was one of those cries that just tugged at my heart. And I looked at my wife and she felt bad too, but I didn't give her the popsicle. And what that meant is she had to sit and watch her brother and her sister eat popsicles and feel like she had been horribly mistreated. Now the thing is, I was working out a plan. My plan was to teach her long term to control certain behaviors and, and impulses that were within her. And it was a good plan. I couldn't give her a popsicle and still be considered a good father. But the thing is, she couldn't begin to comprehend my plan for her life at that moment. And yet, not only was I trying to act out a good plan, but I think I was trying to act out a loving plan, too. I mean, when I saw her suffering, I have to say, I felt more love for her, not less. When my children are suffering, my love towards them is, is more deeply activated than it is when life is going along fine and they aren't struggling. Um, I talk to parents of older children all the time who, as they watch their children struggle, they would say their, their love is greater there's a, there's a compassion, there's a concern that becomes more alive within their hearts and not less. And I believe that as God watches this world suffer in many ways, that as he works out this plan, whatever it is, his love is deeply activated, not just to the world as a whole, but especially for his children. 
And um, now, in many ways, we are in a position where we cannot see God's intention. We do not know what he's up to. But the Bible tells us that he is up to something, that God is operating in love, whether we can realize that and understand it at the time or not. God so loved the world, this says, that he gave his only son. And that second part is the ultimate proof of God's love. The extent in which God loves us is the fact that he is willing to give up his only son. Now, I want to think about this for a few minutes. There are only two examples that I can think of of a person in the Old Testament who does what this says, who gives up one of their only children. Um, the first is a man whose name was Jephthah. Uh, Jephthah was someone who lived during the time that the book of Judges were written in, and Israel had moved into the promised land, but they had rebelled against God. And in order to, to teach them and train them and discipline them, God allowed them to be conquered by their enemies. And the people of Israel would cry out to God. God would have mercy on them and send them a, a hero. Uh, uh, they were called judges. They were military leaders who would come in and rescue and uh, rescue the people. And Israel would turn their hearts uh, back to God, uh, but it was only temporary. The same thing would happen. It was like a cycle that would be on repeat. They'd fall away from God and a new enemy would come in to invade. And Jephthah was one of those judges. He was one of these heroes. When he was young, his family uh, rejected him and he was forced to move away. But when one of Israel's enemies uh, attacked, they, they came back to Jephthah and asked him if he would lead them against these enemies. And Jephthah, you may know the story, he made a promise to God. He said, God, if you will let me win this battle, then when I return from the war and come home, I will sacrifice to you whatever comes out of the door of my home. And we can infer that he thought probably that an animal would come out and he would sacrifice that animal to God. Well, Jephthah does indeed win this war. And when he comes back home, the first thing to come out of his door is his own daughter, his daughter who is his only child. And when he sees that, the passage says he tears his clothes in horror. He figures he's made this vow to God and he, he has to keep it. And his daughter, to our surprise, actually accepts the fact that this will be done. She um, gives him her okay in being a sacrifice. She only asks first that she can go into the mountains and, and mourn for two months first. And when we read the story, we have to ask ourselves, how could this man do this? How could he give up the most precious thing that he has, which is his, his only child? It's a terrible story, and it's meant to elicit a sense of horror as we read it. In fact, one of my Bible professors su suggested that he didn't actually go through with it. And um, I remember trying to understand his perspective on that because the text seems to imply that he actually did. In fact, in Israel, this event had such an impact that once a year, uh, the, the daughters would mourn for four days in remembering this event. Now, here we have a story of a, of a man who sacrifices his only child, and he does it for a very bad reason. Uh, he was rash. He was impulsive. This was the wrong thing to do. It never should have been done. The second example that we have in the Old Testament is the example of Abraham. Uh, Abraham is promised a son from God in his old age, and to his great surprise, God actually fulfills that promise. He gives him a son whose name is Isaac with the, the, the promise that 
uh, through Isaac, Abraham would become the father of an entire nation. And, and yet at one point, God tests Abraham by asking him to sacrifice his one and only son. And Abraham obeys God. It's incredible obedience that he would do this. Any parent who, who again, reads this story is just in wonder at how Abraham could be willing to do something like that. And perhaps just as, as surprising, Isaac, just like Jephthah's daughter, he is willing to go along with this. And so if you know the story, Abraham and Isaac go up to the top of a mountain and, and just as Abraham raises the knife and, and, and to bring down on, on, on Isaac, the question that the reader asks is, how could he do this? How could he give up someone who is so precious to him? And, and of course, thankfully, God stops him before he is able to drop the knife. But what we see here is, again, another example of an only son being sacrificed by a father. And in this case, the reason is that Abraham is obedient to God. Now, these two stories in the Old Testament are kind of like preemptive echoes. They, they prepare us. They set the stage for what is to come because in the New Testament, we have a very similar story. We have a father now who, again, sacrifices his only son. Well, Jephthah, his reason for the sacrifice was just his own stupidity. Abraham's reason was obedience. So what's the reason that this father sacrifices his son? Well, we're told this in verse 17 of John chapter 3. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This father allows his son to be sacrificed in order, this says, to save the world. See, this father, God the Father, knows that the cosmos is in rebellion against him. And he knows that because he is perfect, sin must be punished. But God loves the world. God loves the cosmos. And so the Father and the Son make an agreement. The Son agrees to step in to rescue and save, just like Jephthah's daughter, and just like Isaac, this Son is willing to be sacrificed. And we must thank God that that is true, because this Son is the only son who can do what this says. He's the only son who can save the world. And the reason is that this son is unique. Jesus was fully God, which meant that he was absolutely perfect. And in light of that, he, was, he is perfectly able to atone for our sins. He is an acceptable sacrifice. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5 says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. What that says is that Jesus had no sin of his own. And what that means is that he was able to die for our sins. Jesus is fully God, 100%. But he also became fully man. He became one of us, which means that he could stand in our place. He could represent humanity. And so it becomes like a trade. Jesus offers to sacrifice his perfect life for our sinful ones. When I was um, young, I came down with the chicken pox. Uh, in fact, I guess I was kind of a freak of nature because I had the chicken pox three times. I had it when I was an infant, and then I had it in elementary school, and then I had it in middle school. And the older you are, when you get the chicken pox, the, the worse it is. And I was in terrible shape. Um, I, I remember looking at myself in the mirror in horror. I, I, I couldn't recognize the person that I saw, and I was in terrible pain. I, I, I can remember they 
I felt like I was being stabbed in my body as uh, these, these um, chicken pox would, would just bring out pain. And, and one night, however, I remember my father coming and um, talking with me and I was laying down on the couch in our living room and I remember he began to get very choked up as he saw how much pain I was in. And he said to me, Paul, if there were any way that I could take these from you and put them on myself, I would do it in a heartbeat. And I remember looking up at him, feeling, first of all, so loved because I knew that he meant it from the bottom of my heart. And I remember that love to this day. But I also remember thinking, I wish he could. If it were possible for him to do it, I would do it in a heartbeat because I, I just didn't feel like I could take it anymore. Well, obviously, my father wasn't able to do that, and I had to ride it out myself. But that is the same offer that Jesus makes to any of us who desire to receive it. That God will take from us our sin, our shame, our mistakes, our flaws, our failures, all of the things that, that are within us that make us unacceptable to God. He will take those things upon himself, take them to the cross, deal with them perfectly. And in exchange, we receive his health, his life, his righteousness, everything that is acceptable to God. It is a trade. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God sent Jesus to save us. And the result is this, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Those words, uh, shall not perish, but have eternal life, are incredible words. Because what they say to us is that anyone who trusts in Jesus ultimately will be saved. It's like their soul is sealed until the day of redemption. And what God's desire for us is that we would root our hearts in that. Our security is not in governments, ultimately. It's great if they work. It's wonderful if they respond well. But that's not where we rest our security. It isn't in the continuance of a, of a paycheck or, or um, in grocery stores that function or hospitals or, or anything. Those things are good, but, but our security is meant to be rooted deeply in a security that, that reaches beyond this life. Those who trust in Christ shall not perish, but receive eternal life. I think one thing that is important to keep in mind in life in general, and especially in these times, is that if the worst thing that can happen to a person is their death, if these words are true, if God offers eternal life through Jesus, then we have nothing to be concerned about ultimately. And the sacrifice of Jesus is the proof of God's love. The sacrifice of Jesus is how we know that God is not only sovereignly working out a plan, but that he invites us to be a part of that good plan and to rest in his love. So I wanna ask you just two things as we get ready to uh, close here. First of all, do you have this confidence? Uh, many of you who are watching this today, you may not have ever uh, attended our church here before, but I would ask you, what is it that you are ultimately trusting in? Uh, there's an old cliche that, that goes like this. It's, it says, if, if you were to die today and you were to stand before the gates of heaven, what would you say to God if he asked you why he should let you in? 
I think even though it's a bit of a cliche, that is such a good question. Such an important question for all of us to think about. And it is answered in this passage. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. What this verse teaches is that if God were to ask you that question, if you were to die today, why should I let you into the gates of heaven? The answer to that question is always Jesus. It's always his work and not our work. It's not how good of a person we've been. It's not just some general hope that, that we believe that God is a good God and, and, and he'll let everybody in. It is the fact that, that a person, has, uh, as they stand before God, a sinner, they have received his grace in Christ. It's only Jesus. When I stand before God, if he asks me that question, the only thing that I can say to him is that I do not deserve to come into your kingdom. But someone else has done something deserving for me, and, and I trust in him. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but receive eternal life. Do you believe? And second of all, are you resting in that belief with confidence? Is it, is it to you a pillow and a blanket? I remember uh, long ago listening to a missionary who was speaking at a conference, and he was describing a very harrowing story. Uh, he was in a village someplace, I don't remember where, and he was being chased by all these different villagers who were shooting at him, either with arrows or bullets. I can't remember what it was. And, and he said that, that what he realized during that experience was that if, if God was sovereignly in charge of the number of his days, if, if there was a plan that God was working out that included his life, and if his destiny ultimately was heaven, then he said, you know, I realized I, I am no safer running from those villagers who are trying to kill me then I am sitting in my own living room at home. God determines the end of my days. God's working out a loving plan in my life. Boy, I hope we can rest in, in those things during these times. The, the ultimate solution for every problem in life that the Bible gives us is Jesus himself. It, it says that, that nothing else will do and that God's good plan and his loving plan for this world ultimately rests on Jesus' shoulders. And I hope that you will rest in this truth. I hope that you will enjoy the hope that we have in Christ. I hope it will speak to your unsettledness and anxieties and to mine too. And I hope that together as a church family, we can make our lives about magnifying these truths. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you so much for the hope that we have in Christ. Thank you that you would be good enough to us to send into this world what is most precious to you, your son. And thank you that Jesus, the Son, would be willing to do so. Father, we recognize how crushing it must have been for, for both you as a father and Jesus as a son to experience that. But we thank you that you did that on our behalf. We thank you, thank you for how that uh, transforms our lives, for how we can enjoy you through the death of Jesus as your children. We thank you that it means for us that we can have confidence that things are going to end in a glorious and spectacular way. We thank you that we can know through that that you are for us and with us and 
I pray that you would help us even right now to experience your presence in our lives. We, we need that so bad. Please give us hope. Please give us rest in you. We pray for this world that you would extend your mercy upon us. We pray for all of those who are suffering and struggling and anxious and fearful and alone. Father, the, the thing that, um, that we hope in this is that all of us would turn to you. We pray that this would create a sense in us that we cannot resolve our own problems. They are greater than we are. And yet you have told us here that our ultimate problem is the one that you have sent Jesus to resolve. So please give us faith to trust in you. Please give us hope in your love and your plan. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. There's strength within sorrow There's beauty in our tears And you meet us in a morning The love that casts out fear You are working in a waiting sanctifying us when beyond our understanding you're teaching us to trust your plans are still to prosper you've not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the flood you are faithful forever you're perfect in love and you are sovereign over us. your wisdom unimagined who could understand your Reigning high above the heaven Reaching down in endless grace You're the lifter of the lowly Compassionate and kind You surround and you uphold me And your promises are my delight. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. And you are faithful forever. You're perfect in love. And you are sovereign. us 
share a brief message from the finance team today uh, in light of the current coronavirus crisis and uh, the financial health of the church. First of all, I just wanted to reassure everyone that the church is in good financial health, thanks to God and your abundant giving. Uh, however, we do know there are some significant challenges coming, uh, both individually for our members and for the church as a whole. At the same time, we think this crisis is going to offer some opportunities for us to serve both uh, within the church with our brothers and sisters and to serve outside the church in the community. Because of that, we feel it's really important that you as members continue to give each week. And there's two ways to do that. One is by mail. You can mail a check to the church address, attention to Kelly Steck or you can give electronically, as Devin will explain. Thank you. Here at Grace Church, there's a couple ways that you can give. One of those ways is on our website, which I'm gonna show you how to do now. If you open up your browser, head to the menu, push Give Online, then you can scroll down and push the Give Now button. Once there, you can enter your amount, scroll down and you can uh, change the frequency to a one-time gift or make it a regular giving option, enter your email, and push continue. Once there, you can add your bank account information or your debit or credit card information. Here at Grace Church, we just want you to know that we take your information uh, very seriously and we uh, keep it completely private and secure. If you have any questions about online giving, you can email Kelly Steck at ksteck at gracechurchinfo.net. Another way that you can give is actually by uh, mailing in a check to our address at 220 Bogey Lake Road, White Lake, Michigan, 48383. We just want to thank you so much for your generosity in this time of need in partnering with us as a church to share the gospel with our community. Our mission as a church is to help people become alive in Christ, connected with each other, and engaged in the world. And as we end uh, our service this morning, I want to just invite you to consider and reflect on each of those three categories in your life. Uh, during this time, it is so important that all of us be alive in Christ and connected with one another and engaged in the world. And one of the things that we desire to do as a church, in fact, the staff and the elders have been working very hard behind the scenes to do, is to give you some tools and resources to help that be able to happen. 
So as you think about your own spiritual growth, and as we've thought about that as a church family, we want to let you know that moving forward, we will continue to have church services online. But you'll be able to get our services uh, on Sunday mornings on Facebook and on YouTube and also through our podcast. We'll have that available. Also, we wanted to let you know that three days a week, uh, some of us on staff will be doing uh, video devotionals. Just a, a short five-minute opportunity to reflect on some piece of scripture and to begin the day by by meditating on, on that. We hope that that will be helpful to you. And there's some other resources that we're also hoping to uh, provide. We'll be sending out links to different articles or videos or maybe some book ideas that, that uh, will give you some resources in your free time to help you to um, take care and, and to cultivate your uh, life with the Lord. I encourage you to think about during this time, how will you keep your heart alive in Christ? What are you going to read? What will you uh, listen to? What kind of music will you, you fill your, your ears with? And uh, we desire to help you with that. Second area of our church life is in our connection with one another. And it is our desire that that uh, connection continue, even though we will not be seeing uh, one another as much, particularly on Sunday mornings. We uh, encourage you to get creative in how you connect with people who are in the church uh, by phone or by text or by video message. Uh, at our Facebook uh, page online, we're going to have a special page that will be dedicated to people in the church communicating with one another and sharing prayer requests and encouragement. And so we uh, encourage you to make use of that. You can go to our Facebook page to find that if you're on Facebook. But we also uh, want to uh, try to do our best to meet one another's needs within the church. Uh, there is a page on our website where if you have any needs, you can go to that site and let us know what those needs are. In fact, you don't have to go to that site. We've, we've made it uh, easy uh, to fill out that form, but you can contact us any way that you like, by phone, email, however you would want to do that. If you have needs, please let us know. On the other hand, if you're able to meet some needs, we'd like for you to uh, let us know about that too. If you would be available to pick up groceries for someone, or if there's a person who's lonely and could use a person to, to talk with by phone or FaceTime, uh, please let us know that you are available. We want to connect those people who have needs with those people who are able to meet needs within our church family. And again, you can go to our website to find a bit more about that. And the last category is being engaged in the world. How can we move towards our friends and our family and our neighbors and our coworkers, even when we're not present with them, um, texting, texting, uh, conversations, uh, opportunities to take care of them and love them and show them our concern. I encourage you as you do that not to forget people's spiritual needs, not to forget that the thing that all of us need most is a real sense of God's presence with us and that that sense of presence is given through his son Jesus. Well, I hope that you will feel free to contact any of the staff here at the church. We are here to serve you and to meet uh, your needs as, as best we can. I hope that some of these resources will be helpful to you. But again, we are uh, available to you anytime. Well, why don't we close with the wonderful words of the doxology from the book of Jude. This is Jude chapter 1 verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.